Street Fighter movie review. The rather eccentric, let's go with that, General M. Bison, who enjoys making grand theatrical speeches and declaring victory, even though it doesn't make any sense at that particular point, has recently taken 63 hostages. He is now demanding 20 billion dollars. Within three days and nights, or he will execute the lot of them, and he insists that the world will hold Guile, the... I forget his rank, but officer of the army. I think they're called like the Allied Forces or something like that. Yeah. He insists that the world will hold Guile responsible. I fail to see his logic. Anyway, of course Guile and his forces can't just, you know, let that come to pass, so they plan a rescue attempt. That's really not a spoiler. It's made clear, you know, almost immediately in the movie. And it should maybe also be noted that, you know, if you get into the movie, the actual rescue attempt is kind of fun in that cheesy kind of way. You know, if, if you enjoy cheesy B-movies, you'll enjoy this movie. You know, if not, you know, if, if you don't realize it when you see the opening credits, when you hear the music begin, when you see the logo, the title card, if you don't realize exactly what you're in for, then you deserve what's coming to you from watching this movie. But yeah, if, you, if you're if you not into cheese fests, you, you'll you want to stay far away from this movie. But yeah, like, I'd say the second half, or at the very least, the last third of the film, is nothing but build up to this rescue attempt and the actual rescue attempt. And it's actually kind of fun. It's, you know, it's enjoyable in that cheesy kind of way. Anyway, the big problem for Guile, excuse me, is the location of Bison's fortress, which they can't find. Yeah. And, you know, since... Yeah, basically, that's it. And I guess the whole thing with, you know, basically extorting money from... Uh, the army, I guess, is Bison's way to further his plans for world domination. Of course! Yeah, I, I don't know. I guess he needs further funds to... Yeah, I guess that's one of the few things in the movie that actually make sense when you think about it. So anyway, Guile needs to find the fortress, and he wants to use Sagat, the one-eyed gunrunner who is, you know, trying to sell guns to Bison in order to, you know find the location, but Sagat is not exactly going to be, you know, open to persuasion from the army, so he, you know, he has to find a couple of people to, you know, basically go undercover with Sagat and thus get to Bison. And this is where Ryu and Ken come in. Why both of them? So anyway, Ryu is, I understand, I 
really don't know anything about this game franchise other than that it, it exists and it's about fighting. Presumably street fighting, which there's actually surprisingly little of in this movie. In fact, I'm not sure there is any. But I understand that Ryu is cur you know, commonly thought of as the protagonist of the game series. Or at least this particular game, something like that. And in the film, it's not the Asian character commonly thought of as the lead. No, it's instead the American army person who they choose a Belgian person to play anyway. And Guile makes a heck of an impression because one of the first things he does is actually stop a fight that looks like it's gonna be awesome. So, you know, he really establishes himself as just someone you don't really want to watch an entire movie of. So yeah, Ryu and Ken are a couple of hustlers and, you know, Guile tries to persuade them into becoming double agents. And that's really all I'm going to tell you about the overall plot, at least. There's, uh, there are a couple of other subplots. <sighs> They're... They vary in how little they make sense or how little relevance they actually have. Yeah. The film does do a pretty good job of including a lot of characters from the game. What it doesn't do a good job of is giving them anything to do. Yeah, they're, they're there, and heck, several of them do stuff where, you know, if they weren't there to do that thing, that situation might not have worked out. But it didn't have to be that character there to do that, you know. Really, a bunch of them could have been, you know, amalgamized, and you could have had just five characters doing much of this stuff. And then there's how, you know, basically what the film thinks of as thrilling backstory is basically a bunch of revenge, score not settled kind of plots, basically. You know, there's, there's really not much else to the plot than that. The actual fighting is decent. It's, you know, the, the choreography is reasonable. I'd say the biggest problem it has is that it sticks to these close-ups where it just, it has less of an effect on the audience. We, we need more medium shots, you know, we kind of lose track and it maybe also looks more fake and that's probably exactly what it really was. It was, you know, I'm not sure that all of the fighting was quite done the way it is meant to appear, you know, for whatever reason. I don't know if they couldn't hire proper fighters. I don't know what they hired because it sure wasn't actors or the budget, the stunts, I don't know. But yeah, that's really the main problem with the fighting in this movie adapted from a fighting game. Yeah, that really is the one aspect you want working out. The acting. Man, is it bad. It's actually, there, there are a couple of characters where it's downright funny. You know, I already mentioned Bison. This, you know, Raul Julia. Poor guy. This was his last feature film. You know, or at least that was like theatrically released. I don't remember the exact details, but yeah, this was basically his last. That just sucks. And it could have been Desperado, which wouldn't have been that much better. But at least that movie is slightly more, you know, less laughed at. I, Yeah. But, yeah. He chews so much scenery. I guess that's why the production designers on this film worked so hard. Because they did. You know, it looks goofy as crap, you know, honestly, 
I'd believe Bison way more when he says that he just stands for peace and he wants everything good if his logo wasn't a skull with wings. Yeah, I don't know. I Ask him. He designed it. Or someone else did for him. Yeah, he just... He chews so much scenery in this film that just, it, it's unbelievable. And just the, the manic eyes alone are practically worth the price of admission, at least if you like cheesy films. But yeah, the, the production, the, the, you know, the, the stages, the sound stages or whatever, the basic setup, a pretty good amount of money was spent on crafting stuff for this film. You know, and it looks goofy. It, you know, there are a couple of times where you can tell that, like, steel bars are clearly made of rubber and stuff like that. But they put effort into it, you know. But yeah, Bison himself in general is just practically, he's, he's priceless. There's a scene where he's, like, changing out of his lavish red uniform with a cape and a, you know, the, the hat, the, the officer's cap or whatever you call that thing. And, you know, he's, he's changing into this kind of, what's his name, the, the playboy owner dude, you know, he's got the, you know, thing from, you know, the, the bathrobe and everything looking real classy for a second there. Just a second, you think you're going to see him without the hat. Nope, he's just going to change into his more, you know, relaxed officer's cap. Exactly. The dialogue ranges between just remarkably uninspired and terrible one-liners. Just absolutely devastatingly unfunny one-liners, and in general, jokes. In fact, the humor in this is just bad. It really, sometimes it tries too hard, like really cartoony sound effects, and yeah, just over-the-top kind of stuff, you know. And actually, the film, slightly interestingly enough, the film itself realizes that Bison is completely over the top and, you know, no one takes him seriously. Or, you know, sort of. Several of his own people actually kind of, you know, smirk at him and insult him. Sometimes to his face. And I'm, I'm not entirely sure Raul was in on that joke, though. But, yeah. Or maybe he was, and he just still threw himself right into it. It's it's his funniest role other than, you know, Gomez Adams. And this is the funnier role of those two. Yeah, and I love his Gomez Adams. But, but yeah, in general, the jokes are really bad. You know. And... About the dialogue, that also brings me to the accents. I think they intended for this film to show that this army, in spite of having no sense of what color good camouflage should have. Blue? Seriously? Like in case they drop out of the sky. Anyway, in spite of that, they are very ethnically diverse. This army does have just people from every single country and accents from every single country. And they do range a bit, but a couple of them really are nigh on incomprehensible. And that does include Jean-Claude's. You know, when Jean-Claude Van Damme speaks English, that's not always, this isn't always true, but it definitely is true in this movie. You can tell that some of the time he does not understand what he is saying because the 
intonations that he uses, the the way he speaks his lines, he clearly doesn't always understand what which word means what. Like, he might understand what the entire sentence means, although at times even that's not entirely clear, but he definitely doesn't always understand the specific separate words. You know, sometimes his line readings are actual line readings. It's like he just, he's, he's reciting stuff he read, you know. The costumes are again, you know, effort is put into them, if they sometimes do look goofy. And hey, several of the characters from the games either start out in or at least end up wearing what they do in the games. And that helps us non-fans, you know, notice who is who, you know, because otherwise, again, we really wouldn't be able to tell because they have very little to distinguish them. Carlos Blanca, who I do know, I know what he looked like in the game, so I have a little frame of reference here. In this, he's treated as a sort of Frankenstein's experiment, and that's kind of fun. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's very amusing to see that, especially when they hang up the, you know, DNA mutagen and anabolic plasma, which to me looks a bit like, you know, soda pops, basically. It, and it looks tasty, too. I, I, you know, I kind of envy him. Strawberry flavor or something like that. It looks good. The pacing is fine enough. There are a couple of twists and, you know, the, the basic plot really doesn't have a lot. You know, there, there's not that much going on in the basic plot of the movie. It really just, it, it is basically Bison took some hostages, Guile is trying to find his hideout, and then, you know, they assault it. And yeah, that, that really is absolutely everything. We don't even, you know, really get a proper sense of how far Bison is as far as... You, know, you don't even really get, like, a sense of if they don't, you know, defeat Bison now, he might become too powerful, you know. Or if he gets these 20 billion, he'll become too powerful, which I guess that makes a certain amount of sense if he can keep buying troops and equipment. The end, yeah, the subplots, <laughs> they vary, but there's, you know, they're sometimes nonsensical. One is almost kind of after school, especially. The effects are not terribly good, but at least it has some explosions and, you know, the Chicks are reasonably hot. That actually does bring me to, you know, well, yeah, with with the chicks, there's basically two. There's Cammy, who is portrayed by Kylie Minogue. I can't say that she acts in this movie. She appears and she's wearing a costume, and she's kind of hot. Chun Li is actually pretty cool. You know, she kicks some ass, and she's, you know, they... I, I can't speak to her characterization. I don't know what she's like in the games, what her backstory and personality is. But she is kind of cool in the movie, and genuinely enjoyable to watch, you know. She's actually the one character in this film where I'd maybe watch, you know, outside of just enjoying it on the cheesy B-movie hokey level. The movie doesn't really overstay its welcome, it's like 90 minutes. It does, however, end with a horrible 
Good Morning Vietnam ripoff with jaw-droppingly terrible jokes. And it's, it's one of the best, you know, the arguments for just stopping the movie right after it ends that I've ever come across. It's, it's usually, you know, out of respect for the people that made the movie, even if I didn't like the movie, I will let it run through the end credits. But with this, that's a tough call to make, you know. Although, you should watch the end credits all the way through at least once. Because the very last thing that they show, you need to see that at least once. That, yeah, if, if you watch, if you sat through the entire movie, you gotta watch that last bit, definitely. The music overbears the crap out of every scene it's used. I can't tell which is worse. The the parts with lyrics that literally just spell out the theme that the scene is going for or when there are no lyrics and it's still trying to be like dramatic because it's again it's way over the top. It is really cheesy and goofy. And I believe that covers every aspect. Yeah. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.